We all have big dreams for our business, or maybe we're dreaming of starting a business or a side hustle, and you know that Instagram and social media is the place you need to be to get that idea off the ground and in front of your target audience. But sometimes that task seems really big. Well, I was chatting in the DMs with one of my followers and she began to ask me a ton of questions about, well, how do you do this? How do you do that? And I'm like, I know she is not the only person who has these questions and I know I can help her navigate through what might seem really confusing when starting a new business. And then I took it one step further. I thought, how cool would it be if she turned the tables on me where she got to ask the questions and I got to answer them. And I'm probably going to help answer questions that you may have about your very own business side hustle or new business you're beginning to start. Are you ready to hear these questions? They are phenomenal. Episode 200 starts right now. Hey there, welcome to the Laura Shipman Show. We hang out here weekly to talk about things like social media, entrepreneurship, marketing, tools, strategies, tips, and it all starts right now. Hey there, before we get started with this show, I just want to share my passion with you. I love teaching people just like you how to master social media for business, breaking it down into easy to consume and easy to execute steps so that you can see immediate results. So whether you want to start a social media consultancy or grow your brand's presence on social media, I can help. I can help you get started and master all the things that you need to know. So I want you to go over to my website. It is filled with resources, tools, tips, and courses. Visit laurashipman.com. That's L-O-R-A shipman.com to get all the goods. Now you ready for the show? I know I am. Let's get started. Well, hey everybody, welcome back. I'm so excited you are here because I have a very special guest and we're going to do something a little bit different, something I haven't done on this podcast before. So I'm not going to formally introduce my guest because I want her to do it and I want her to tell you what her background is and then we'll get into why we decided to do a podcast like this. So Sharon, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do first. Okay. Well, I am a mom living in Northern New Jersey and I'm a journalist by trade, but I'm interested in launching a design business that's kind of a word of mouth, local, costs less than an interior designer, but curated organization and design business that really tries to speak to what a busy family needs and how to optimize living in their space. Okay. That's really good. That sounds really interesting. I'd love to like get to know more about that. I'd Um, love to tell you more. (laughs) (laughs) I love like the whole interior design aspect and like the organizational stuff that's coming up. And I see a lot of people talking about that. And I think it's really important because we do need to streamline our lives better, better than we have been because things just seem to be so busy just to solve that problem. Well, I mean, and especially living in the world we're living in right now, and unfortunately with the situation we're dealing with right now, I feel like we are spending more times in our homes than we ever Mm -hmm. have before. And we need them to serve a multitude of purposes. And a dining room doesn't always have to be a dining room if you're not entertaining right now, if you need it to be a homeschooling space. And sometimes somebody knows that their kids have grown out of their playroom, but they're not quite sure how to transition it to serve their family better moving forward. So how do we turn that into a space where your teenagers want to gather and you're able to call your house the hangout house and you can keep an eye on things that way, you know? So I think that there's there's definitely a, a, a calling for it. And I feel like it's a time where people are interested in investing in a way that brings their house to be a place of peace and serve them better and I think you can do that on any budget. I don't think you really have to blow it all out in order to accomplish it. That's so good to hear. (laughs) That is so good to hear. Well, it's 
funny how this podcast like kind of came to be because you reached out to me on Instagram and asked me a question and I was getting ready to just answer that question. I thought, wait a minute, this could go a little bit deeper. And I'm thinking there's got to be more people who have this, these same sort of questions. And I thought, why don't we just make a podcast out of it? So it's kind of like coaching style, but not really, but like just a conversation about your overall questions. And I don't want to give away everything because I want you to go ahead and ask the questions and then we'll, we'll just go from there. So thank you for entertaining to do this, this with me this way. No, I I'm excited to talk to the expert. (laughs) Okay. So, so why don't you um, tell us what that first question was that kind of started this whole thing for us? Okay. So I am really in the initial building of this idea. And so I'm building a, a following on Instagram that, you know, of course, you would love for that to be partly comprised of people who would someday be interested in your said business. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of questions that go along with that. And so I feel like there are a lot of people out there who would like to launch something, but how do we best use this platform and optimize our following so that it works for us in the future, even though you don't actually have that business launched yet? You know, and that's such a great question because I think a lot of people are starting side hustles and things like that now Mm -hmm. that they've been working from home and they realize, you know, this working from home thing isn't half bad. You know, I kind of enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's funny that you asked that question because I also am in that space where I'm thinking, I kind of want to start something different too, like not, not go away from what I've got going, but like a side hustle for myself. And I think the first thing that I would say is to really connect with that community who you think would benefit from whatever product or service you're going to deliver to them and just become really ingrained and get to know those people first. A lot of people they'll start a business and um, without really taking the time to get their not get to know their audience really well. They'll just start mm-hmm. and kind of, um, what, what do they always say when you're an entrepreneur, you kind of build the plane on the way down, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, and you're uh, like doing all these things, but where you don't have it completely a business yet, you kind of have an advantage where you can do a lot of like focus group work that many people don't do that right away. And right. you can get all of those things in place. And so, um, Part of it is just doing that that focus group research. Well, I think you get an opportunity to decide, to decide mm-hmm. what parts of it are most important to you, what parts of it you think are most important to your consumer. Um, I know that, you know, I, I would love to build my journalism into this. Mm-hmm. So kind of like an in-depth interview with, I don't feel that don't get me wrong. I love a good home goods or target, but Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's house (laughs) should look like a home goods or a target. Mm -hmm. I think we should be intentionally building things and taking bits and pieces of, of more interesting personalized pieces of your family and then filling the holes with kind of the less expensive bits. But, but your house should only be able to belong to you. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but, you know, as you go along on the Instagram journey, realize that, you know, okay, I definitely don't want to be a spokesperson for a brand. I feel like that there is power in, you know, just being unbiased and having your own voice and, you know, you, and you see what draws people in and what maybe doesn't get as much of a response. And I think that is a real benefit when it comes to building something from the ground up. Yeah. And I think you have that unique experience right now to do that because you can see what people totally cling to or don't cling to. And I think you're right. I love a good target shopping spree and a good home (laughs) goods spree, but I don't want my house to look like everybody else's either. That's right. And, And so I think if you do enough research to find out how many people actually feel like that and start building your tribe around that one characteristic of your brand and your business, I think that will go a long way. Because then what you end up having are these people who are super fans, right? Because they they got to know you really well and like you're speaking their language. You're not Mm -hmm. talking about going down those aisles of Target all the time. So I think, yeah, does that help a little bit? Yeah, yeah, I think so. What do you feel 
is the most important feature of Instagram when you are exploring it as a future business? That's a really great question because I think the easy place to go to is to the feed because you can take a picture, you can make it look pretty. You do need to put some work into the written aspect of it. But I I almost think that's the easy way. I think Mm -hmm. video has increasingly gotten more important over time. But now I think we're at that peak where you've got like reels, you've got IGTV, you've got stories, you've got live. And there's a reason for video having that many outlets on Instagram. It's what the people want, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think think if I was just starting out, I would really make a big splash in the video features of Instagram because I think – from what I understand and what I've seen and what I know, that's where Instagram is widening the reach for people Mm -hmm. who are using that. And when a new feature comes out like Reels, I think you need to be there because that's where they're giving the most of their um, attention to is Reels. Like Instagram is saying, we're going to prioritize Reels. So you want to be an early adopter of that. Have you gotten into Reels much yet? I have dabbled. I think I saw a couple. Yeah. (laughs) I have dabbled with, uh, you know, what kind of Oz to choose for a heavy flower Mm -hmm. or, you know, how to most easily get your kid to be self-sufficient through organization. But I'm still a bit of a novice. But, you know, um, another thing that I was going to say is, so I would try and embrace that. But if there's one thing that I learned before Reels came out, there was TikTok. And I was like a longtime lurker on TikTok. Like, I just loved that content. And I thought to Mm -hmm. myself, why do I love it so much? Because it's not, it's like, at the most, a minute clip, right? Mm -hmm. I think that was that was where the magic was for me is it wasn't a huge time investment, but I got a lot out of it. So instead of that long warm up phase to where the value is, the person has to deliver in a minute. And so if I was to tell somebody who's starting a business where I should spend my, where they should spend their time, I would say in that short video clip is where I would spend the time. So that would be um, stories and reels. And Mm -hmm. I, because you get, that's what people want. They don't have a long attention span, so they drop off after a while. Now, how often should you be generating something like that in order to keep your audience returning? That's a good question too. So here's the thing. With stories, I think 10 times a day is really good for stories. And we were just kind of talking about this before. We felt like we knew each other already, although we've never met face-to-face. And this is the first like true face-to-face meeting we've had. We've had face-to-face meetings over Instagram, but in a delayed you know, reality, not a real, you know, real time like we are now. And right. so the reason why I say like 10 for Instagram stories, it's a great way for you to document your day. And that way your followers or your audience get to know you on a more intimate level because you're taking them, say you did three posts in the morning, three posts in the afternoon, and three posts later on in the day. That's like nine story clips right there. And then just for round number sakes, throw in one more to make it 10. But I think that gives your audience great exposure to who you really are and who your authentic self is. Now with reels, um, I don't know what the answer is to that yet. And I'm still kind of testing it out myself. Um, Mm -hmm. I've been trying to do it at least once a week. I know some people... That's what I've been trying to do too. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. I know some people have converted their entire Instagram feed to just Reels right now because... You know, the importance that Instagram is giving on Reels, they're getting more exposure that way. So I don't know how my audience would feel about that, though, if they just saw me come on, you know, for 30 seconds on Instagram and just say something really quick. Sometimes I would think they would want to know more information and me to go a little bit more deeper than that Reel gives me. Do do you recommend keeping those Reels in your grid? if you are interested in having a certain aesthetic on your grid? Yeah, so that's a great question too. So you can do one of two things. I, I'm i trying to go in a more authentic route with Instagram right now. So I'm not doing a lot of reels, uh, thumbnail artwork at the beginning, but then I know some people are. And when I look at the people who are doing the thumbnail reels, it all kind of looks the same. And I'm not really sure what that initial message is when I go to their, when their feed. But if I go to somebody like mine and you can see, well, right now she's 
I'm just making it up, doing something with graphics or she's doing something with her dogs or whatever, they know they get an idea of what kind of content to expect in the next 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So I think it really, it depends on the user, what they're trying to do. Um, But if anything, I'm noticing there's a trend for authenticity, Um, especially the audiences. I don't think they want to see that perfected feed anymore. Like, remember how that was so Certainly not. I just worry about it catching me making like a ghoul face. And then that's on my grid forever. (laughs) (laughs) It seems like, well, I could choose from ghoul face, cockeyed Mm -hmm. eyebrow, or, you know, looking like a horse, you know? So which one do I pick for the grid? (laughs) Right. That's a good point. Yes. I I understand that too. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I understand that for reels, hashtags work similarly to posts. Mm -hmm. And I know you're a fan of using the maximum number of hashtags. Mm -hmm. How do I know that I'm using the right hashtags to find future clients? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think um, I like to do a couple of things. I like to do some that are location specific. So if you're trying to attract people in your local area market, you want to pick from that category right there. Then I like to pick things that um, hashtags that solve someone's problems. So, and think of them in terms of keywords, like what are people looking for when they're having this problem? And then um, you want to also pick hashtags that describe who that person is. So when we first started talking today, you told me you you were looking for people who were trying to find multiple uses for their homes, right? The different rooms in their homes, how to do it kind of on a budget or at least so it's not so expensive. Um, There was also that family aspect there too. So maybe it's the moms who work from home who have like certain kids in a certain age group. Um, So maybe they um, have certain, I don't like, I would say like the work at home moms, those kind of hashtags, the family lifestyle hashtags. So I pick things that describe who your market is as well, because they're going to those hashtags. I would also describe, well, sometimes I think often your ideal client is not unlike yourself. So I would describe or at my ideal client, I guess, at this point as a suburban mom, and she very well might be a working mom, but mm-hmm. I think the key is that she's a busy mom mm-hmm. and she's she's interested in design and in making her house a special place, but she may not necessarily have that time to do it herself, or she may not just have the ideas to, you know, synthesize, you know, what's important to my family and build that into design. She knows what she likes and what she doesn't like, but putting it all together is not the best use of her time necessarily. So I think that's who I'm I'm hoping to serve. I would also say somebody like me too, who I am not good at interior design. I would rather, like I'm intimidated by it. So maybe Mm -hmm. somebody who's intimidated by, like, I don't know what that exact search term would be. You would have to kind of look it up a little bit, but who wants, yeah, who wants that guiding hand? I know what I like when I see it. And so then I'm going to try and mimic that, but I don't Mm -hmm. know how to get there first. I have to see the, you know, I'd have to see what you can present to me. And right. Yeah. So that right. would be the, I feel the design like I've been challenge. fortunate enough that I've connected with a lot of amazing people in the sphere who are also organizers or who are mm-hmm. successful designers or, mm-hmm. you know, but I, I feel like sometimes am, am I connecting with enough people locally and, you know, are you connecting viscerally with, with the people who would see you as a future go-to? You know, it's interesting you say that because I was... <clears throat> Because I was on a coaching call with a client um, earlier this week, and she asked me kind of the same question. And she said, you know, I'm really frustrated because she's a business coach and she's putting out all this great content and she's using all these great hashtags. But the people who are following her, other business coaches, they're not the people who are going to purchase from her. And so she's really frustrated with that. And I said, you know, what you need to think about is attraction marketing And she's like, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, think about it this way. Think about what are the things that your target market is interested in? And I'm just going to make it up. Maybe it is how to create quick weekday night uh, dinners 
um, every week, or maybe it's motivational quotes, or maybe it is um, how to do a really good batch of laundry. I don't know, whatever it is, but like it's a it's a hack or a tip or a trick that if you put out there is going to attract your target market. It's not necessarily for the product or service you're going to provide them, but at least you're on your on their radar because so it's not necessarily in your niche, but it's still applicable to their lives. Exactly right. Exactly right. And so then all of a sudden they see you you come up and you're like, they liked that quote so much, or they did what, or they liked whatever tidbit you gave them, then they go check out your profile and then you've got them, which may be using those targeted hashtags before may not have worked for that one person. Yeah. Yeah. I did an at home pedicure cuticle tip takeaway this morning, because as a former beauty editor, that information is just comes out of my pores. Um, (laughs) And it wasn't really related to decor at all, but I was like, Oh, here's a good tip. And I think other people could use it too. So throw it out there, you know, exactly. Um, When do you feel, so after you feel like you're starting to build, here's a question. There's Facebook groups that are very successful, let's say, in Mm -hmm. your specific area. Mm -hmm. But at what point do you want to introduce yourself to that specific community? So like my account has been public for a year and a half, but I haven't gone to my actual community group of moms to be like, hey, check me out, because I didn't know if I wanted to do that before the business launched. When do you think is the ideal time to introduce yourself to a larger community? Because you don't want them to not be interested once things are more refined. Yeah, I think um, what I would do is I would get to know who those communities are and join them, make sure I'm a part of them and interact as a member, not really talking about the business or anything first, because that way you're going to know if you're in the right group to begin with. Um, and then kind of do your research there and let them get to know you. And then um, they're going to get to know, like, and trust you within that group without any strings attached, right? And that's like the best way to build anything, I think. And then when you're ready to pull that trigger, pull it, but make sure you have somewhere for them to go. And maybe it's your own group. Maybe you invite them to join your group um, that's attached to your business page on Facebook and, mm-hmm. and go from there. But I would definitely make sure you find the groups that resonate best with you in your future product and service, make a state, like be a part of that group authentically and have those people get to know you. Not just under your personal name, but under your business name. Yeah. And just, well, I, yeah, because what is your business name going to be? Is it going to be your personal name or is it going to be a business name? You know, honestly, I haven't decided whether I will just keep the mom renovation as a business name or whether I might tweak it to speak a little more to what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So the thing that's interesting, so a couple of I things. I belong to those groups under a private, private personal name, name uh-huh. and I contribute under a private personal name, but perhaps I should consider affiliating with them under my more journalistic name. Yeah, maybe, but I would wait until you're ready to really filter them over there because they might, out of curiosity sake, check you out. That's what, that was my initial question. Yeah. So you don't want to bring them there until you feel like you're at a certain stage of professionalism. Yeah. Or where you can really offer them value because then that might brand your business in a certain way that you're not ready for people to think of you that way. That's Um, right. And then the other thing we've, you know, I always find naming a business like such an interesting topic because I sometimes, I have named businesses for myself before a certain name, not really realizing the impact that they would have, or if I wanted to pivot a little bit, how much the name of the business actually pigeonholes you. Mm-hmm. So, um, so it's just interesting. Like if you have time to think about that, how could that business flex and how could it pivot? And would that name give you the room to pivot, you know, pivot with you? So, right. and so I chose my name, you know, to be my business name. Um, and sometimes that's worked out really well. And sometimes it's not worked out so well. And mm-hmm. in one of the instances that it did not work out well is if I were to rename my podcast again, it would have something to do with social media and entrepreneurship because that's where I shine. It's just my name though. And it doesn't tell anybody anything about what mm-hmm. I do from a podcast standpoint. So I don't know. It's just, it's interesting to think that one through a little bit and chew on it a bit to figure out where you want to be. 
with that. Oh, and one more thing about that too is if you are ever interested in selling that business later, if it's got your name attached to it somehow, mm-hmm. that makes it a lot more difficult to make it saleable. So, yep, that's an interesting point. Um, when it comes to the buttons that are displayed on mm-hmm. Instagram, mm-hmm. how do you best use those for? business that's about to be would you file everything that I find that I do stories more often than I do posts I feel like Mm -hmm. my following is stronger on stories than posts so as a result I save a lot of things in the buttons but I Mm -hmm. don't know how tailored I should make them so you're talking about the highlights right when you talk yeah I love buttons um how tailored should you make them? So I'm the type of person, if I'm looking for specific information on something, I want the ease of going to where that information is. So if you're, I'm just making it up, talking about kitchens, for example, Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I can go to the kitchen highlight and see all the information about kitchens, but not have to go through bathrooms too, (laughs) if that makes sense. Um, Is that what you're talking about? Is that Well, so the way I have it set up Mm -hmm. now is I kind of have the about me button. Mm -hmm. Then I have um, separate buttons for decluttering tips I've given, Mm -hmm. decorating tips I've given. Then I have our entire renovation in buttons because we just did a major demo and and reconstruction of our main floor and our basement. So I kind of take everybody along the journey, starting with the decluttering to picking out the tile, to going to the stone yard, to all of those things. And now I'm kind of focusing a little bit more on decorating those spaces. We haven't moved upstairs. Eventually we'll go back to the renovation part again, but now I'm kind of more on the decorative end of it. And I do something every Sunday called the Sunday swoon where I kind of round up. It's kind of a curated bunch of interiors that I've spotted around Instagram, things that I think would be inspiring to other people or give them ideas about what they might like to do in their future spaces. And I file those by room. So I have, and they're all clearly marked as to the source where they came from to make sure I'm giving that interior designer or whoever did the space accurate credit. But if you click through, you'll see like a hundred beautiful kitchens under the kitchen button Mm -hmm. and a hundred beautiful dining rooms under the dining room button. So I've kind of started to rather, they used to just be under inspirations and now I've divvied them up more separately uh, by room. But I just wanted to know how many buttons you should have. Is there too, is there such a thing as too many buttons? You know, there might be. I, um, it's funny you should say that because I haven't really dove, dove into that so much as far as Like, what would I get bored with? I'm just trying to think to myself, like, how many would I actually slide through before I got Mm -hmm. to the one I wanted to? Um, That's a really good question. I mean, you certainly would want the major contenders, like the kitchen and the bathroom. But, you know, do we we do stairwell? Do we do patio? Do we do... How many is... Is too many. Yeah. Right. Right. How many do you have now, just out of curiosity? You know what? I should have counted before we got on to be completely certain I'm I'm not sure I would I'd venture to guess between 10 and 15 see and that's where I was going I would I was thinking like in my mind when you were asking me I'm like 10 sounds like a good number and I'm just Mm -hmm. trying to think like how I would slide through that so much and then you're going to come through some stuff that's just outdated that maybe even with certain trends doesn't make sense anymore so you would just try to edit them periodically Mm -hmm. and pull out what no longer makes sense yeah so like I'm just I'm on your Instagram right now Mm -hmm. and yeah I you know I would say 10 to 15 is probably good because you're not going to want people to keep sliding through and get bored because they're not going to get to the end of Mm -hmm. everything that Mm -hmm. you have. And then I would just get rid of the stuff that's not really relevant anymore. Yeah. There are a few stragglers and I think I will eliminate them. Do you recommend doing button uh, pictures, highlight pictures that are straight from your stories or some people put cover art 
I like the cover art because it almost gives you an insight to what they're going to see um, because people, I don't think, read a lot. So for example, for mine, I have like one of the things I do is my gator sightings. I just, because there's so many around where we live and I think people are fascinated by alligators and how they're in people's neighborhoods and backyards. Um, so like I have an icon just for um, gators and all you see is an, an alligator icon or I have like the Instagram logo for Instagram tips, paw prints if people want to see my dogs. And I think that is just a quick way for people to... Do you think a picture of a blender on an artistic background is better than a picture of a kitchen? Ooh. Um, Yeah, because here if I think of like it might be hard to see that highlight circle is so small. And so if you put a kitchen in there, I think you're going to lose... The people are going to wonder what that that is. But if you have a blender or something that's very kitchen oriented, I think that would make sense. Okay. Yeah. What do you think of uh, the linking options that have become available? I only, since I don't have swipe up capabilities yet, mm-hmm. which just kills me because my favorite thing to do is to share tips or great things that I found and I'm desperate to say swipe up. I did just start a link tree where, you know, I don't get any percentage or anything. It's just a simpler way for people to find what I've been talking about. And I did put a link tree in my bio just this week where I'm going to start just putting up the things for the week that I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. But there's, I know there's, that's not the only one. I know that some people use shop styles, some people use like to know it, or some people do use it as a purchasing possibility. Um, So what do you recommend do you have any favorites or do you have any are there cons to that um I really like the link tree because especially if you do the um the upsell like you get there you can put as many links in there as you need to it can be branded to you and a lot of times like I've watched people um on TikTok, for example, use Linktree and they're getting commissions off of things like their Amazon favorite finds and things like that. And they're right. using Linktree for that. And um, so I think it's a versatile, uh, a versatile answer for what you're looking for because- um, And I know it could also be another way to drive people to a website. Yes. And so eventually probably, I don't know if you have one already. Mine but, is under construction. I, okay. I pulled it because I want to revise it. Okay. Um, But eventually you'll probably have like a lead magnet or something there that you're going to want to put on your link tree. So people are going to end up in link tree for um, different reasons. And I like it because I can scroll through there and see all the various different types of links people are sending me to. Other Mm -hmm. people maybe not feel that way about it, but that's how I feel about it. I like it. Um, Plus the other thing I've noticed with some people who have website links there, their Instagram is not letting them click, letting audience members click through to their website because maybe they don't have an SSL certificate attached to their website and that can be very expensive. And so um, Instagram flags that as like a suspicious link or something. And so it shuts down that link. With Linktree, yeah, with Linktree, since they're a partner with Instagram, it's a recognized um, link. That, pe- that Instagram finds okay for people to sense. use. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do you DM people when the time comes and you are ready? I mean, nothing bothers me more than when I feel like I've established a friendship with somebody through Instagram because I followed that, or they followed me and we've had casual chats and then they're like, hey, sign up for my fitness you know, boot camp, and it's like, no, 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 no. We're never talking about that. And it leaves a bad flavor in your mouth because it's like, I thought we were buddies. Right. So how do you DM people when you are ready to kick off without coming off as slimy or or ingenuine? So the way that I do it, because I hate that and I hate mm-hmm. being like cold called in my DMs. I really do. Right. And so the way that I do it is I will put a poll or a DM sticker or something like that on my stories. And if they answer that they have interest in it, then I will DM them and say, hey, I noticed, no, no pressure or anything, but I noticed you were interested in this. Is this something you want to pursue or not? That way I'm just not jumping in their DMs trying to sell them. However, and like I'm, I think I'm very you know, authentic in the way that I post that on Instagram because people will know 
if I, like actually I just did one today about um, doing a second round of a boot camp that I'm doing. And I said, are you interested or do you still need more information? And so however they answer that, if they need more information, I'll say, hey, you were looking for information. This is what it's about. It's not a sales thing. It's just literally information. But if they said, yes, I want in on the next one, I might DM them back and say, hey, I've got your name on a waiting list. So as soon as I'm ready to launch the next round, you'll be the first to know that sort of thing. But in either one of them, they're really not even a, a strong sales thing. It's just mm-hmm. making it available for them to make the next the next move. Does that okay. answer your question? Yes, yes. I think I think that's a good approach. Um, I'm going to ask this question before I forget because okay. <laughs> it, it, I, it occurred to me right before we got on. I said, oh, I would definitely want to ask that. So if you have a business account, then Mm -hmm. you are probably already aware of the insights and the ability to see generally who's following you, you know, age, kind of where they're living and when they get on, right? But who's following you now is not necessarily your optimal customer base. So how do you figure out what time is your best posting time? Because sometimes I feel like my insights might show my best time to post is 3 p.m., but that's when a lot of like other business people are on and creating content, not necessarily when my busy mom is coming on because she may not have time to check Instagram until all her kids are in bed and she's finished up her last email. Right. So that's a really good question. So I kind of believe that you can train the algorithm a little bit in that in that stance because I played around with that a little bit um, where I used to post like first thing in the morning, like 7.30 in the morning and stuff like that when um, I was there having my first cup of coffee. But then um, I changed that a little bit and that worked well and I got a lot of um, engagement and connected with a lot of people. But then my schedule changed and so it was a little bit later on in in the day that I would post. And so I noticed it took a little bit of time but eventually it caught up. Eventually my audience caught up with my time change. So, and if we say that your ideal audience is a lot like you, even though the analytics say one thing, if you know as a mom that those kids are in bed at 8.30 by 8.30, that's when your downtime is. And that's when you're going to be on Instagram. Right. All the things. So I say, Go with your gut in this instance. I so think don't necessarily abide by the insights. Yeah, because like I know it says for me three o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm sorry right. if I look at my, who I am and I look at my thinking that my, my mom's trying audience, to rush home and make dinner. Yeah, the last thing I'm doing at three o'clock in the afternoon is looking at um, Instagram. I'm like trying right. to figure out my next move, you know, for right, my day. Right, right? You're just trying to survive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, That's a trying so, to survive hour. And then, and so then what I've done lately, and another good way to test this is, say you have two times in your head that you think Instagram might be good for you. Mm -hmm. I would do a post. So I do a post sometime in mid morning. And then I've been doing another post like around seven or eight o'clock at night. And so it, there's no crime in posting twice a day. If you have the content and it's not going to make you crazy, you can do a little beta test here to see which one's performing better for you. In the quality of people who are also interacting with that post. Is it really your uh-huh. target audience or is it just someone skimming through? Right. Okay. So you recommend dabbling at different times mm-hmm. yeah. to really determine what is most successful. Yeah. Because like the algorithm's not really going to tell you or your insight's not really going to tell you the actual personality of the person who is looking at your content at like 7 a.m. versus, you know, 8.30 p.m. You're going to know right. when you look at those people who interacted with the post, which one's more likely to be your ideal customer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That so. does make, that definitely makes sense. Yeah. So always be testing. <laughs> That's yeah. the one thing. Yeah. Do you feel like somebody who is a multi-hyphenate, you know, can be seen, it, is that, somebody who dabbles in more than one area successfully, or even uh, more, even a little bit uh, more specifically, like I'm both like to design and I like to declutter and I like to, you know, curate and take things from a more introspective journalistic 
point. I mean, mm-hmm. can you be seen as scatterbrained? How many things, you know, if you're also posting what you're cooking for dinner and how you're doing your nails and, you know, what great activity your kids did this weekend, is that seen as too scatterbrained and not refined enough? I think there's, um, I think it's all in how you approach it. So I, and originally I had just recently done this analogy of a house, right? So you have like a foundation, a really strong foundation, and that's your bread and butter posts, the posts that, you know, really work well. And then you've got like four pillars, um, that hold up the house, right? So, and those are your four interests that you talk about. And so maybe they're like your kids or your, you know, you pick four of those, Um, but you make sure you distribute those posts evenly throughout your feed. Otherwise, just like a house, if you pay attention to one pillar too much, it's going to get lopsided, right? And not support the house. And then um, the rooftop is all of the fun fluff stuff that people like to see occasionally and stuff like that. And you sprinkle that in. So if you can think- The roof is the silly or or the the humorous mom quote or the- Exactly. That kind of, yeah, that fun fluff stuff. Right. Um, the clip about your laundry. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All that stuff. So that's what I would do. That's how I approach it. Um, so that way, because we are multifaceted people who have all sorts, and our businesses are multifaceted. I think if you don't, I think you're, I think your Instagram will get boring if you only talk about one thing over and over again. Right. And I, it's, and plus we get to know you through all of those different things too, and who you are. Right. I find that it's easier for me to do it in stories than it mm-hmm. is for me to do it on my feed. And that's I okay. feel like I try in stories every day to do something decluttering, something personal, something that's, you know, design worthy and, you know, something with some levity. But I feel like when it comes to the permanency of the feed, it freaks me out a little bit, I think. <laughs> I get that though. I get that though. But I think like decluttering could be a good feed post for you because I think you could take somebody through a carousel post. Have you done those? Yes, I do carousel posts often actually, okay. especially with like a before or after, mm-hmm. but I would never want like a before to be the permanent feed picture, for example. Yeah. So what I do for those is I create like um the first slide is going to be like an introduction slide. So it looks pretty okay. and it'll maybe it's just even text, but it's pretty text and it's laid out nicely that compels the person to slide to that ugly before picture and then be <laughs> wowed by the after picture, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I would attack that. But I think you're right though. Um, stories is a fun way to go through all of those different categories that maybe mm-hmm. you don't necessarily want in your feed. Yeah. Right. But this has been great. Thank you so much for taking time to answer some of these questions. I feel like I have some more clarity about what to focus on moving forward. Well, good. I'm glad this was fun. It was a fun way to do a podcast. So thank you for playing along and saying yes. Thank you for having me. (laughs) All right. So that was everything, all your questions for today that you had? Yeah, I think that's, unless there's something else that you think that uh, I I didn't cover. Uh, You know, we didn't talk about bio and, um, Mm -hmm. you know, your ideal headshot. uh, Oh, yeah. If you you want to talk about that quickly. Yeah, I think, and I haven't really looked at your bio, but I think um, as long as you have like a a strong I help statement that tells people exactly why they're coming to see you and what problem that you solve, I think Mm -hmm. that's good. Bio pictures are interesting. Um, Obviously, I never say to put a logo out there unless you're a big brand like Coca-Cola or something like that. Um, But someone like you or me, I think a nice clear headshot with a clean background is good. And if you have props, that makes sense. So for example, mine has my microphone in it with me because it just makes sense because I'm a podcast. That's an host. interesting idea. Yeah. So if it's if it's a big enough prop that doesn't overtake your face, um, but you can get it in there and it makes sense, add it in there and see what happens. It just clarifies why people are coming to see you anyway. Oh, right. It thing- actually might make a typical profile picture a little bit more eye-catching because it's it's interesting. Why does that person have a pen behind their ear? Why does that person, you know, why are they holding what they're holding? 
Yeah. The the other thing that I would do too, oh, you've done it. So um, you put Sharon dash design and declutter, which is really mm-hmm. good because sometimes I will go into accounts and see who's following that account. And you're looking at this list of names, but there's no nothing identifying about those lists of names. So it's really smart right. that you did that because right. now when you show up in somebody's search, they know what you do right from the get-go. They don't have and people are lazy. They don't want to have to go to somebody's account to figure out what it is they do. It was really smart mm-hmm. that you did that. So yeah, that was good. Good. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. This was so much fun. I had a blast doing this. Yes, likewise. Hey there. I just want to say thank you for spending time with me here today. I know your time is super valuable, which is why I am dedicated to providing lots of usable, actionable information in the shortest amount of time possible. Before you go, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a future episode. And if you have ideas or topics you would like me to cover in an upcoming show, let me know about it in the comment section provided. 